Why is that light on me? <laughs> I can't see a thing. I, uh, I can't tell you the feeling uh, of walking in here tonight and seeing so many people that are in urban ministry because I'm so old that uh, when I started, if you'd have had one of these conventions, we could have met in a telephone booth. <laughs> uh, we were so discouraged. I'll tell you how old I am. I, this is the truth. I, I'm fortunate that my daughter's here from New Jersey and her significant other, uh, Lonnie and Steve, and they walked in and we were trying to find us. This is the truth. And I said, you know, we're looking for this dinner. Because I mean, we've been invited to come in and I'd met my daughter in Philadelphia. I'd come up from Washington and we had a great time together. And, but we weren't real sure where, where to go. And, and I asked this lady, I said, we're looking for this dinner we're supposed to go. I'm supposed to say something. And she said, uh, well, there's a number of dinners. Is it the retirement party? <laughs> I said, boy, I really feel good being here. <laughs> But thank you for letting me share a few things tonight. I don't, I don't want to give a speech. I, I, uh, I feel like I'm speaking to the choir, and sometimes the choir has to hear some things too. And, but sometimes the choir needs encouragement. And uh, maybe because I have been at this so long, maybe if I share some things with you, maybe uh, it's kind of like one of the theologians said, it's one beggar showing another beggar where to find some bread. And. Um, so I'd like to d take this more in the spirit of just sharing a little bit of the journey that, that I'm looking back at now uh, after 40 years and seeing some things along the way that maybe could be encouraging to you. Uh, it was so funny. I was at a thing this summer. Uh, it was introduced as having something to do with education. And, uh, uh, Vice President Gore had asked me to come down to a, a thing in Tennessee called the Gore Family Reunion to talk about families and schools and all that. And I'd known him for a good while, and been, nobody had ever asked me how I got into education. And he, he were up on a stage, and I never know quite what I'm going to say. And I got up there, and he said, I didn't know he was going to ask me this question. He said, well, Bill, I've never asked you how you ever get involved in education. And I said, well, probably the day I got kicked out of school. And there was this dead silence because there was a lot of heavyweight brain types in the audience that were very offended that I would be there to speak on education and um, be functionally illiterate. But I think that's how it all started. I, I uh, grew up in Pittsburgh and I uh, didn't do real well. And my mom was brought into school and said to take me out of school because the reason I was in so much trouble is because I couldn't handle the work. And I was labeled. I already felt like I was dumb, and that just put the nail in the coffin. I, I should have figured it out because the three previous years, I was not allowed to change classes. <laughs> and I should have figured something was wrong there. And then it was all guys, and our homeroom teachers were the football and basketball coaches. But somehow I didn't get a clue that I wasn't doing real well. <laughs> and so some of my friends that were in that predicament went inward and destroyed themselves. I, I went outward and got into worse trouble. And if it wasn't for somebody coming and hanging out, and that's the real reason I'm here tonight is because somebody cared about me. And I get real tired when people say, well, it's too late after a certain age to turn young people around, et cetera, et cetera. Fortunately, this person didn't believe that because I was 17 and most of my friends were older than me and everybody had given up on us and felt like there wasn't any hope. We'd been labeled, branded, and on the waist dump. And my new uh, headquarters after being thrown out of schools was Nobby's Pool Hall in, in a part of town that nobody wanted to come in anyhow. Unfortunately, a volunteer for Young Life in Pittsburgh decided that uh, he was going to come in. Fortunately, he'd been a football player at the University of Pittsburgh, and he was too big to throw out. Uh, I acted tough, but I wasn't a fool. And uh, he didn't belong there. But that's what love's all about. It dares to go someplace where sometimes you're embarrassed and you don't feel good about being there. And I didn't trust anybody, and I sure didn't trust him because he didn't even fit. 
But if it wasn't for him spending a year of his life trying to turn a few of us around, I wouldn't be up here tonight. The five of us responded out of that whole group, only five of us. And we're the only five that aren't dead or in jail because this one person decided to take God seriously and loved us into change. I couldn't even use those words back then. And I didn't know what a camp was. I, I think the thing that really got me turned on is the guy, he said, I'm going to give you a scholarship. Nobody. That's the only scholarship I ever got. And that was to go to camp on a bus. Uh, these ranches they have. And, and he didn't tell me they were going to talk about God at this ranch. And I got real angry at him after I found out that's what it was about. But we were out in the middle of Colorado. And I wasn't going to go walking back. And to his credit, he said, I didn't know what to do because I know you wouldn't have come if you'd have known. And your friends wouldn't have come. And I said, but you're making a fool of me because they follow me and they hear all this God stuff. I'm in deep trouble with them. And he said, but I really love you guys and I took a risk because of the God I love has helped me love you. And I just want you to give it a chance. And it's taken 40 years to begin to turn my life around. I went from an at-risk youth to an at-risk adult. Uh, it's been a long journey. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> I feel like it's the horses coming to <laughs> take me away. <laughs> it stopped, right? <laughs> But when I came back, uh, two of us decided to give the rest of our lives that we were going to give it back to the streets because we were given a second chance. And we were going to start a little organization to do something about it. And I was 17. My partner, Vinny, was 21. And the only problem was that the reason Vinny was in Pittsburgh is that he was wanted in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord gave us great intelligence. And we decided that maybe he ought to turn himself in before we started our youth work. Uh, that it wouldn't look real good if he was picked up while we were helping people. <laughs> so this journey starts very humbly. And fortunately, they were able to get me back into school. But I want to, you know, people sometimes, because I've gotten to be around and, and speak in different kinds of situations and work in situations, they, they always want to know what your credentials are. I don't have any. And I'm here because... God loves me, and I've been on a journey that is amazing to me. Um, I, I did eventually finish three freshman years of college, uh, <laughs> which uh, totally prepared me to go into education. Uh, in fact, I had the Secretary of Education under Jimmy Carter say to me, you were so far outside the paradigm, you couldn't see it. <laughs> but when Vinny got out of prison, we kept our commitment, and we moved into Harlem in 1960, and uh, spent 11 years uh, learning life. Uh, the reason we went there wasn't because it was a big deal. I had never been there, but Vinny used to buy his drugs there and sell them in Newark. And he wanted to go back and show the power of God in his life that he could go back to where he was and give his life back to the, some of the folks that he destroyed, including a lot of his own friends. And I had one skill. I was 20 at the time and went on 21, and that was hanging out. And you can understand that. Unfortunately, they don't give degrees in hanging out. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of board members. I, I wear a shirt and tie now and a suit because of what I do, and they think I still, that's the only skill I have is hanging out. I just dress up now. <laughs> but as so many of you that are out there in the trenches understand is that nobody was out there with the people. They always wanted them to come into this church or into this program or into that thing, but they weren't out with the folks. They weren't in the trenches with the people. And love goes where people are. And they're willing to lay the life down without any expectations that something's going to happen because of you. And I know for sure I wouldn't be standing here tonight. I knew when I was confronted with Christ at that camp 
If I'd have said no, the Young Life guy would have still loved me in spite of what I believed. And love doesn't have any strings attached to it. And sometimes we get into all our verbiage and all our doctrines and all our stuff, and people feel shut off from us because if you don't believe what I believe or if you don't, we don't trust the Holy Spirit's going to do it in his time. And I, w I didn't grow up. It was so weird because I grew up with nothing, and then all of a sudden I'm in this Christian thing, and they told me it's all grace, it's all a miracle, God comes to us, we don't go to him. Then they turned around and beat me over the head and said how I had to go around beating other people over the head with Jesus. Well, who's in charge? And so on the streets I found out that the answers weren't so simple as so many of you on the streets have learned. The answers aren't simple. And fortunately for me, I picked, we picked a little apartment uh, on 117th Street in Harlem, and a few blocks away I was hanging out and this minister came up to me and he said, I don't care how good you are, white boy, you need a base. And it was the Church of the Master in Harlem, the Crossroads Africa, and some other movements had come out of, and that was our base. And then that also provided us with meals, so we didn't need a lot of money. And as I testified in Congress when they were asking me why this and that was happening, I said, I didn't go there to start a program. I went there to love my neighbor. I wouldn't have known how to create a program. But because we were out there, as you know, loving our neighbors, they, all of a sudden we packed the church. And we had basketball leagues and everything. You've all done it. And then Vinny came one day and says, Bill, how can we say we love these kids and let them live on rooftops? And nobody had taught me. They just said, just love Jesus. But what do you do when the Jesus that you're dealing with and that other person sleeping on a rooftop because they don't have any place to go or they got a Jones or they got some problem? And so we got into housing, kids, not because I knew anything about housing, or we ought to have a housing program. If you love your neighbor, you don't want them living on a roof. It's simple. We make this so complex. Woo, it's moving now. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I thought I was being taken up. Do you want me to sing? Or <laughs> He's got it together. Is that it? Do you want me to hold it? Oh, okay. Anyhow. <laughs> For five and a half years, we had 25 to 30 young people at a time living with us. And I learned a whole lot about what I didn't know much about, and that was about community. Because what I, we were discovering without knowing it was that one of the biggest issues in America is there's so many young people that had not one personal relationship with a caring adult, but the other thing I was learning is we'd lost community. I didn't know how to be community. Uh, I didn't have a, an adult that believed in me until I was 17. I just sure didn't know anything about community, but you live in... 25 to 30 people, a lot of them trying to kick drugs. And you walk in and you see people dying in your apartment and you wonder where God is and how can God care about if they're letting them die and I'm failing and I feel then again, it's all me. And fortunately, we were forced into caring about each other because, as you know, when you're in the foxhole, you need each other. And that's what community is about, is loving one another in spite of what the gifts or what we've been given. And we needed each other. And I buried 18 friends during that period. And I'll never be the same. And I was very angry at God. And some of the stuff I talked about and wrote about became, it was just getting my bitterness out. Because how can you see people die in 10 blocks away? They have all the resources in the world. And you're down here and you see it. It was very confusing to me. And I wanted to believe that maybe God was willing to allow violence. And I became very angry until I found out that it takes a lot more courage to love your enemy than to destroy him or to fight back. But it's a different way of fighting back. Anyhow, we backed into education after that. Not again because, I, as I said, I didn't know a whole lot about education. But we said, how can we say you care about somebody? They find Christ or they, or they find love. You've given them a place to live. They got to go, and then you find out after they're, they're trying to make it 
that they're reading at a fourth and fifth grade level. How can you say you love your neighbor and not want to do something about that? Jesus loves you, but I'm not going to give you the tools to take care of yourself and your family. We'll keep you in a religious slavery instead of freeing because of the dignity and respect that God wants us all to have. And so that was one of the funniest nights, by the way, because Vinny had an eighth grade education. I had my three freshman years, so we were ready to take on <laughs> the uh, education establishment. Well, at that time, I, you couldn't see my face because I had forgot to shave and get a haircut for quite a while. And I had found out I could speak. I felt real inferior. I never could get up in front of people. And I found out because of this anger and the, and the pain, I was able to speak. And all of a sudden, I was being asked by students because the riots were happening, the movements were happening. And I was being asked to speak at Princeton, Columbia, New York University, all these places. Not by the administrations, but by the students. And what I was saying, I didn't always speak out of love. It was truth, but not out of love. But all these young people wanted to help, and I wanted to get our young folks back in school, but because of some of the things I was saying and because of the tone I said it in, I wasn't welcome within 100 feet of a school. And so we said, we'll start our own school. They don't want our kids back in because they kicked them out in the first place. So again, I had no idea. You, don't, you do these things not because there's some plan. You do them because love tells you to do them, and God's love. So we decided to start our own school. And in Harlem, we started a school. And I took all these smart young folks that were dropping out to march on this and that. And I said, instead of marching, why don't some of you teach? I'll get them there if you'll teach. And so, uh, and by the way, I wasn't real smart at marketing. We called our first school a liberation school. It was a really cool name for attracting young people. But if you're into fundraising, don't use those names. Uh, <laughs> People weren't into funding liberation schools. So one night a couple of students suggested when I was in a mellow mood that maybe if I changed the name we'd get some money. And I said, well, what do rich people call their schools? And they said academies. So hey, let's call them academies. And we put this sign up on the side of this building called The Academy. And it was later written up by the Ford Foundation as the undercover job. This guy came down, I'm sitting in the first boardroom I'd ever been in, this huge boardroom at the Ford Foundation, looking crazy as I did, and they're offering me money about this miracle in Harlem. And I said, you know, about eight, ten weeks ago we were called crazies. So I learned marketing. I didn't even have to go school. Just change the name, they give you money. <laughs> so, anyway, Every part of this journey has been learned through failure. And then it was going real well, and I happened to be at the right place at the right time. I happened to be a white boy in the middle of a black and Hispanic community. And so the community wanted me to be the liaison to Wall Street because they felt I could hustle some bucks to get more school. So I felt real inferior to people like that because they wanted me to go. I went down there. And uh, until I met them, <laughs> I didn't feel as inferior. <laughs> They were real smart about building their buildings and their businesses, but they didn't see the 10 blocks away where we were starting to destroy America and what we were predicting was going to be two Americas in the next 25 to 30 years because we were dividing this country between have and have nots. So they were afraid Wall Street was going to burn, and I knew it wasn't going to burn, so I said, give me some checks and there won't be any fires on Wall Street. <laughs> and, and, and that was my first fundraising. Uh, <laughs> Any of you want to, I teach a course in it. <laughs> but we ended up with 18 schools. Bedford-Stuyvesant, Lower East Side, Harlem. And then every time there was a riot, I got invited. So I got to go to Detroit, got to go to Newark, and we'd start these schools. I'd get a corporation, I had an IBM school, AT&T, American Airlines, Union Carbide. Whoa. Thank you use the strength to do this. Here we go. And uh, I get these corporations to start building the bridge between the streets and their world because they were so far apart and our young folks never believed they could ever enter those buildings, let alone get a job in it. If our folks are never exposed to that world, 
then there's something wrong. But this whole thing happened outside the system. And because the thing started working, I, I found out what they do is they bring you to Washington to testify. And I didn't, I thought testifying happened in churches, but they said it happened in Washington. And literally, the only other time I was in Washington, I'd been arrested, so I wasn't sure what they were bringing me back in for. <laughs> so I get in there, and they call them hearings. And if you ever want to come to Washington, any time of the day, we got hearings. I swore them off some years after that because I, I began to realize they called them hearings because nobody's listening. <laughs> because if they'd have listened to what we were saying, and I got up there, and I didn't know you had to have all these formal white papers and all that stuff. And, they said, where's your paper? I said, I'm not into papers. And they said, what did you learn? I said, I didn't go there to learn. I went to love my neighbor. They don't understand that kind of talk. Don't ever do that. <laughs> they get really scared of that kind of talk. But I said, you know, I did learn some things. I said, you know, all those years, I never saw a program change anybody. And 25 years since then, I haven't seen one program change one kid's life. It's relationships that change people. A good program has simply created the environment where healthy relationships are happening between adults and children. <laughs> Let me just tell you something. God takes the humble sometimes to confront the mighty and the weak and those that aren't so smart to sometimes give wisdom to the intelligent. And I felt that happened that day. I'm not putting myself out. I just didn't have much of an education. I had a street education. But God will not allow that to stop us if we stay faithful. And I said another thing we learned was that the reason our little storefront schools work was because we began to understand that you got to get a person turned on to living before they're going to get turned on to learning. The system was trying to pour information into kids that were coming in there broken as so many of all you are working with. And how can they care about learning if they don't think they're going to live three more years? Or they don't feel there's any hope to get out? I said also, and, and, and we have to understand this, and as people that are out there working on the streets, you can't be just about individual salvation and change. You've got to be about corporate change as well as individual. And what we were saying is that the poor had become institutionalized, public defenders, public welfare, public housing, public education. And we warehoused the poor. And I said, what we need to do is take these large institutions and break them down into small, caring communities. Anything in scripture is totally able to be integrated into the world at large. The idea of love and relationship didn't come out of a sociology book. The idea of community didn't come out of some communitarian movement. We were meant for community. And so we say we have to break these institutions down into small units and replicate smallness on a large scale. The big is not beautiful. That we lose any sense of belonging and caring. See, if you don't understand the world that you're ministering in, then sometimes you aren't doing very much good for the young folks you're dealing with. We have to understand the world that we're ministering in. We have to understand why we're in the situation we're in. See, I told him that some of our smarter folks that, that joined us, we were realizing, I said, you know, these young people aren't dropping out of school that are living with us because of education. They're dropping out because nobody knows their name. They feel worthless. They're disconnected. In fact, if I was to give a title to these words tonight, I'd call it connecting the disconnected. I got connected to a God who cares that helped me connect to my neighbor and get my neighbor connected to the resources that they need. Before the internet was the human net and God's net to bring us together. I said, you know, something happened back there during the Industrial Revolution, but then it began to grow rapidly after World War II. What happened was that we took apart what had been the mediating structures for young people, which was the extended family and relationship with the religious community were raising the children. And I think what we witnessed in the 60s, and we've had a lot smarter people do a lot of research on it and, and say it was right, 
is it was the first generation in large numbers to, to grow up with not only lacking a personal relationship with a caring adult, but, but no sense of community. In fact, uh, General Powell and I were speaking at a thing for Governor Hunt down in, in North Carolina just before Christmas, and I used this illustration that I said the reason I'm working in schools isn't because of education. I'm working in schools because I felt schools fell into the vacuum that was created by the breakdown of the safety net. And I said the reason schools are in trouble is not because of education, it's because schools are being asked to be mother, father, sister, brother, social worker, hall guard. And that the violence of the streets went from the streets into the schools and then we expect teachers to teach who don't have time to teach and are afraid. And how can we say we love our neighbor and not go in those schools and love our teachers and love? Well, I said that, and General Powell stood up afterward, and he said, I'm going to switch what I'm going to talk. I'd like to start where Bill left off, because he said, I grew up in the South Bronx, and I went back to my neighborhood after I retired, and it's destroyed. And it was poor when I lived there, but we had that community Bill was talking about. He said, we didn't have the Internet. We had an aunt net. The aunts were hanging out the windows, and everything you did was known by the time you got in the house. <laughs> we have to understand that we are not just to connect young people to Jesus, which is the beginning, but we have to be community for them. Right down the street, somewhere around in Philadelphia here, uh, uh, the presidential summit happened here in Philadelphia that some of you probably were at and heard about, where all the presidents and General Powell and all, to call this country to turn it around for young people, to begin to make a dent in the 15 million young people who are disconnected. And I had a chance to say a few words on the last day. And I never know what's going to come through because I, I don't know how to write a speech and read it. I have to trust God that it's going to come out somehow. And so I got up there and it hit me. I said, you know, we really don't have a youth problem in this country. We have an adult problem. I said it's important to have race relations classes and male-female equality classes and that. But I said in 40 years, I've never taught one class. But you know what I've watched over all those years? If you want little kids to love one another and care about one another, if we as adults work together across black and white and male and female and brown and don't make it an issue because we're in the trenches out there trying to turn young people's lives around and connect them, the little kids start eating together. They don't need speeches. They need to see it. And if we're going to be properly ministering out there, we have to understand we have grown up without community. And you can't give away what you don't have. And if any body of people that should be together, it's the body of Christ. And if we aren't loving one another, we're competing with one another. How can we expect the children to turn around? I was asked one time in another hearing I did, sin and go back to another hearing. And this senator was asking me a question. He said, I don't understand what you're saying. And I said, you know, I'm screwing up. I don't understand what I'm saying either. Help. Uh. <laughs> and I said, I think what I'm trying to say is you're crazy. And I said, not you, sir. <laughs> but I said, government's crazy. Foundations are crazy. Companies are crazy. Churches and synagogues are crazy about how we give away our money. And I said, I'm coming off the street saying this. I'm not coming out of any particular bag. I'm just saying, I said, the way we give away the resources to help the children out there, it'd be like IBM saying the best way to type a letter would be to have 26 typewriters, each in a different room with a different letter on it. Go over here to get your A's, over here to get your B's, over here to get your C. Kid needs a PhD in systems to get help. And I, so I'm not, I think, the root of the word holy means to take that which is fragmented and make it whole. And if we're fragmented, how could we expect holiness? I said, we all need to be working together. And we need to tell the folks who fund us to quit funding us to compete with one another. 
I told him to say, I said, you tell us to partner and work together and to love one another. That's like telling us to circle the wagons and shoot each other because you reward us around little individual programs rather than rewarding us to work together in community with the various gifts that God's given us to work together. And if you say, and I say, that we care about children, we better understand systems, we better understand how money's spent, we better understand what community's about and what happened to us because you can't change something if you don't understand the situation you're in. You may do more harm than good. I said, in the name of good, we're destroying communities. That help is not always helpful. It can keep people in slavery. <laughs> can I take a little more time? If I fall asleep in the middle of my own talk, <laughs> feel free. They, uh, at that summit, they said that every child needs and deserves a personal relationship with a caring adult. Every child needs and deserves a safe place. Every child needs the opportunity to give back. Every child needs a marketable skill. Every child needs a healthy start. You know where they came from? They came from the streets. We took them and gave them, and here we were, coming from the streets, and the next thing, I'm standing there bawling like a baby because here are presidents and generals standing up quoting those truths that came out of a ministry that started with dropouts. If we stay at it for the long haul and we aren't there for successfulness, but for faithfulness, we have no idea what will happen. And now we have a country that's out there talking about delivering these resources, and you're the folks out in the trenches that need to gather those resources and get them to the children. Every child needs and deserves a personal relationship with a caring adult came out of what we learned through young life and going out and somebody loving us and us going out and loving them like what you're doing. It's not going to happen if you don't do it. But somebody has to connect all those resources they're pouring out there to the children. I have to tell you a quick story. Just before Christmas, and I'd had a pretty painful month, and I got back home, and I didn't want to listen to my phone messages, but because I'm a phonoholic, I had to listen to New Year's Eve, and I thought, oh, it's going to be problems. Because <laughs> you get a, a run of problems and discourage. And there were the first week, of course, people needed things. And the fourth one was, Yo, bro, it's Frankie Baez. Frankie Baez? I haven't seen Frankie Baez since 1968. I didn't even know he was around. He didn't know I was around either. What had happened is he was telling his story to, he's now a Pentecostal minister who had just taken over a large church outside Denver, and he was telling his story about this guy that he lived with in New York named Bill. No, I didn't. And he said, Bill kicked me out because I lied and I went back on the heroin. And I came back a few weeks later down to 98 pounds, and I'd been arrested, and I was facing 15 years at Rikers Island. And Frankie begged me get him off the wrap if I could. I said, I won't. He said, you'll die much faster on the streets than at Rikers Island. I don't think you're ready. And he says, no, I promise I will. I'll do anything. I said, okay, I'm, I'm partnered with a group called Teen Challenge over in Brooklyn. I said, they're pretty radical on how they deal with this stuff. And in those days, back then, if you went in there, you probably weren't going to come back to the streets. You were going off to some farm somewhere. And I said, you're pretty citified. He said, just please go with me. I said, I don't know if any judge is going to let you off because I said so. So we prayed and we went in there, and sure enough, the judge was crazy. He let him off. <laughs> to me. Uh, he said, he, he, and I said, look, as long as he stays at Teen Challenge, he's okay, right? And he said, yeah, the day he steps out, 15 years, no parole. So I was allowed to visit him the first six weeks, and he made it through the six weeks, and then they went off, and I never saw him again. 
didn't know if he died. I didn't know if he made it. He didn't know if I died or if I made it. So he's standing up there in front of <laughs> this church telling his story that he didn't know. And there was a young lady there that happened to work for this organization I'm part of called Communities and Schools in that area. He came, I think I know that guy. And he called me. You never know. You plant the seeds. It's not us to change, is it? And what was so beautiful is that my wife Jean and I had to speak at a thing called the Aspen Institute out in Aspen, Colorado this summer. And we went in a day early and we went and broke bread with Frank and his wife, who has a son in medical school and a daughter that's married. And he said, hey, look, you may not recognize me. I've gone from a skinny Puerto Rican to a fat Puerto Rican. <laughs> and I said, I'll recognize you. And we embraced, and at the end of it, he went around the table and he hugged me and he said, Bill, I've waited all these years to say thank you. That was God healing me and saying, don't give up. And parenthetically, what happened is that we went out and we were at this speaking thing a day early and the ranches that I went to was one hour from Aspen over the mountains. Uh, over in Buena Vista, Colorado. And I wanted to see a person named Goldbrick, Andrew Goldbrick Delaney from Philadelphia, who had been the cook there when I went out there for so many years. He retired some years back. He was in his late 70s. I wanted to go see Jerry and Goldbrick. And we go and we go over the hill, and fortunately, he was sick, but he was up and around, and we went up to this little cabin. And it dawned on me going over that mountain. I had tears rolling down. I never thanked Goldberg. And so we were together. And what happened was, see, when I went to this Young Life camp, I don't know how many of you know the organization of that. They're a little more strict now. Back then, if they found somebody like me that they were afraid was going to, whatever the term is, backslide or something, they knew I was going to backslide. After my week there, they put you on this work crew. And I knew God was alive because that word work quite frightening to me at the time. I didn't quite like that word, but they said, you stay a work crew and we're going to get you stronger. Well, about a week on work crew, the guy was a work crew boss, was an ex-Marine, and I got mad at him. I used some language that hadn't quite left my system yet and shoveled dirt in his face. Well, that's not a good Christian act, I found out. <laughs> and they said, I'm going to the head guy, Jim Rayburn, and we're going to send you home. And I said, I've been kicked out of better places. And so, because I was hurt and I was used to being rejected, I went back into my old stuff, my old pain, and literally, I started walking down this road. I was going to walk. Who knows where? Buena Vista was eight miles apart, and that was four buildings. And Goldbrick, was, the cook, was looking out the window, and he came down, picked me up in his Jeep, and took me into his little cabin with he and Jerry, or I wouldn't be here today. And I said, I never thanked you, Goldberg. And we had tears rolling down. And he said, he said, before you came along, and Harv and some of these folks, I never saw anybody with my skin texture at this ranch. I didn't know whether Jesus cared about our folks. Because we brought the first urban folks out there to that ranch. And Goldberg just passed away a few months, two months ago. And I knew that God wanted us to feel the circle, the power of relationship, the power of the Holy Spirit that that's what's healing. That's what brings us together. Every child deserves that. Every child needs the chance to say thank you and to be thanked. That didn't come out of a presidential summit. That came off the streets, and now they're shouting. Every child needs a safe place. How many of the children you're working with are safe? They aren't safe at home. They aren't safe in the streets. They aren't safe at school. How can we say we care about kids and not create safe environments? Kids feel safe when you have a lot of adults together. I took some folks from Prudential into Newark a few weeks ago and took them into a school in Newark that we were working in. And these, they always have a little talk at overtime at the end of the tour. That we're hustling them for some resources. God wants them to relieve themselves of no threats anymore. Just give. 
And at the end, we always make sure young people are sitting there so that we keep things honest. And so they were asking a question. And one of the questions said, hey, this is the first school in this community we've gone into that doesn't have a metal detector or security guards. Why is that? And one of the kids said, I'd like to answer that, sir. He said, there's so many adults in here, we can't get in trouble. Because what we had done was take a senior citizen home two blocks down where people were dying, the elderly, because they were shut off from life and they were poor and they didn't have a chance to give their life back. And if it's more blessed to give than to receive, then why do we lock people up and not give them a chance to give? Part of the separation and we broke down community is, is that we put older people out to pasture younger and younger in little kids' institutions earlier and earlier, and that's unnatural because both need to give their lives away in order to find their lives. So these senior citizens were now eating in those lunch rooms, and the kids quieted down because of the power of, of the elders being there, not disconnected, but connected. And there was tutors in there from, from the university. There was health workers. The church had its mentors in there from the church down the way, and they began to open their doors and was a safe haven after school so kids are safe from early in the morning till it's time to go back home. We have to think differently. God said he has given us a new mind and a new spirit. We have to use these brains to think about new ways to change society and take what God's given us and change those institutions as well as the children. Otherwise, we're picking up children off the waterfall of destruction, but we left the waterfall go. And they keep pouring out there because we need to use these brains that God has given us and the wisdom that he gives us to find new structures and new ways of creating safe places for our children. Every child needs and deserves a chance to give back. That's out of Scripture. I was asked in that hearing, what's the difference between the children you've seen make it and the children that haven't over all these years? And I was so angry when they asked me that question. I went, it almost went into my old nature, and I wouldn't have been here tonight because I was ready to go across the table at that senator. Because you have three minutes to answer a question from all these years, and all I saw was some faces flash before my face that I had to speak at their eulogy, their funerals. But like the Holy Spirit works, about 30 minutes, 30 seconds into it, I said, what's the answer? <laughs> and I couldn't have thought this up in a million years. I said, they made it because we allowed them to make it. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know yet. <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> what do I mean? <laughs> well, one way you could get a hearing real quiet they start saying something about scripture. I said, well, I said, I didn't know much about scripture until I went to the streets. I said, I didn't know the Psalms from the Palms. But I started reading that stuff, and I said, hey, this is crazy. It says you get your life by giving it away. I said, I, every day, I, every advertisement I ever see on TV or everything in the newspapers and magazines, it says you get your life by getting it. And I said, they were basically raising me to be white, right, and uptight get the right deodorant on, and look the right way, be, I said, it's getting your life. Then it says, it's more blessed to give than to receive, and I said, all I see is greed. But I said, if it's more blessed to give than to receive, then every child ought to have a chance to be about that, because if we love them, we want them to get them in on that thing. And I said, help is not always helpful. You can destroy people. If you don't really believe that that young person has something to give to you, then maybe you've got a question whether you should work with them. Because if we think we're better, that's why we label people, well, I work with drug addicts. Oh, my God. Well, that young lady used to be a prostitute. We like to label people. Jesus didn't label people. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. I'd be there, too. And if you believe that child has a gift to give to you, then you will liberate that child because identity comes when that young person finds out they have something to give to you and you've been able to receive their gift. The greatest gift you can give somebody is to allow them to give something to you. That's why we've got to create schools and churches and other 
institutions in our community, we need to break them down into small caring units where people can give to one another as equals. I'm not bringing you up to my level. We're all at the same level. And I'll take what I have and give to you, and you take what you have and give to me. Every child needs and deserves a chance to give back. And finally, they need a marketable skill. I thought it was enough that I talked to kids about Christ, and I had the personal relationship, create that safe environment, give them a chance to give back, and they don't have a skill to compete. How can we say we've liberated somebody if they can't take care of themselves and their families? We've kept them in slavery. I frightened my staff to death last week when I accepted to speak at the technology conference in Washington last week because I don't know how to unload, uh, reload, download. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, they, I am illiterate, but let me tell you, again, if we trust God. Fortunately, I got to speak last because <laughs> they're talking about all these internets and I mean, all that stuff. I know the language a little bit. <laughs> but I said, we need that for our children. Because poor children don't have that. They can't compete. And we're going to have our country divided much faster between have and have nots. We have to understand that technological world that's out there. We need to know it and make sure those resources get in our children's hands so that they can get the jobs that are out there in the future. But I knew I was there for a reason because I got up and I said, along with high tech, you need to have high touch. That we need to create caring, self-empowering environments that when you put that technology in there, it's being used because kids are turned on to, to, to living. Then they'll get turned on to that learning. I'll wind this up. It's awesome to look out over this crowd and see you all, because I've felt so alone so many years. And I know it felt good to you to come in. A lot of you feel, felt real alone for a lot of years and out there in the trenches think there's nobody else out there caring, but just look around you. And thank God for it, because you aren't alone. But I urge you to not get in your own little cocoons out there, in your own little ministries, but to take it out into the world and take the gifts of what God's given us and to put it out there. I was with our organization down in Texas and it was a room filled like this and because we've seen our little thing grow from one school with 80 kids now up to 45,000 kids down, broken down into these small units in these schools. And I finished speaking and I was going up an aisle there and I saw this young, because we never allow a meeting without young people in it, in our organization, because we want them to keep us honest and they have much to teach us. And somebody that wanted to teach me was waiting till I finished talking with one of the staff, and they were all going off to their workshops, but he waited, and he walked up there, and I walked up. <laughs> and I told Jill, I said, I think he wants to say something to me. A very large young man. Uh, name happened to be Jose, I found out. And I said, uh, you want to speak to me? He said, yeah. And so he gets me in a little corner there, and he said, uh, are you the dude that, uh, you're the dude that founded this thing, right? This communities and schools thing. And I said, well, I'm one of them. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. So I mean, right. It was the longest pause I imagined, and he got a little teary-eyed, which was not expected, and he says, I'm alive because of you. I never met this person. But if we're faithful in small things, then it spreads. And you never know what it's going to touch or where it's going to go. There's a generation in search of a future out there. We have to break the back of poverty. This country can't make it. If 15 million of our children are disconnected from any hope, unless there's an army of people out there totally committed to going out there and knowing somehow, somehow, God is going to use you, and you may not see it for years. But we've got to break the back. I thank God for you, and I thank you for the chance to come up here and share this tonight. And I hope a little of my journey has helped you 
and encouraged you in your journey. Thank you.